the shooting range. In this episode, the bomber that outpaced fighters, the Tupolev SB-2. Delving through live.worthhunter.com, a selection of fantastic user-made skins. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with the deadly German AA gun. With an unpronounceable name, the second Geppert. Flugabwehrkanonenpanzer Geppert. Forget about the whirlwind and the times when you had to hide behind the backs of your teammates. The Flak Panzer Geppard deals destruction wherever it goes. Two 35mm Orlikon autocannons are great at shooting down planes, but the German SBAAG also has no difficulty fighting most tanks at its level. This is one dangerous kitty. It has an amazing turret traverse speed, great mobility, and a maximum rate of fire of 550 shots per gun. Moreover, it's no coincidence that its name means cheetah. The Geppard can reach speeds of up to 45 km an hour in rough terrain and an outstanding 65 km an hour on the road. All that doesn't mean that you can spray enemy tanks down with lazy bursts across the side of a vehicle. But if you're smart enough and you play your cards right, even some of the top tanks are fair game. That requires some preparation, though. You'll have to research HVAP ammo first. Before you get to that point, you'd better be hunting enemy aircraft, other SBAGs, and light tanks. Trust us, your enemies will not forget those encounters anytime soon. The Geppard is a very tough opponent up close, and certainly not an enemy that you'd like to see while turning around a corner. Its top shells penetrate up to 100 mm of armor at 500 meters. Just take into account the fact that when you're using the HVAP belt, you shoot one HVAP round followed by three HEIT rounds, and the tank wrecking round will be coming from your right cannon. Aim accordingly. A few extra tips, as is tradition. Get behind enemy lines and find unusual avenues of approach. The Geppard is an excellent vehicle, but it wasn't built with the head-on engagements in mind. Flank your enemies and then shoot at those juicy spots at the sides. Remember, this SBAAG has a rather high profile. It is also carrying an antenna that can be a huge giveaway. If you're hiding or preparing for an ambush, make sure that your opponents won't see it. Be active. Don't stay in one spot, however nice, for too long. And the last thing, don't forget to share your experience with your friends and drive Japanese ground vehicles. They are getting the Type 87, the Japanese Geppard, very soon. Now, let's talk about what is arguably considered the most formidable bomber of the mid-30s. Andrei Nikolaevich Tupolev was not only a gifted aircraft designer, but also a true patriot. When it came down to working for the motherland, he gave his all, and expected others to do the same. He chose the best people for his team, and then ran them into the ground. At the same time, he was completely fearless. Not a member of the party himself, he wasn't afraid to speak his mind in the presence of basically any political heavy hitter. Furthermore, every time his colleagues overseas achieved a breakthrough, he considered that a personal insult. Junkers designed a giant bomber? Okay, Tupolev didn't just design the huge TB-3. He also managed to persuade the Soviet decision-makers to step up the production of Duralumin. His involvement was so great that for some time Soviet engineers called the material Tupolev's metal. The nations of the West were building massive flying boats? Okay. Thanks to Tupolev, the USSR quickly got its own fleet of flying boats. But the Soviet designer hated this kind of arrangement. He hated to be forced to catch up. He wanted his nation to be in a lead to make others play catch-up and look up to Soviet aviation. And that's where the Tupolev SB came into play. Just look at it. Sleek forms, a high-speed wing, a monocoque fuselage with stressed skin, a closed cockpit and retractable gear. The new machine was called Skorosnoy Bombardirovshik, or high-speed bomber, which had to outpace most fighters. Tupolev and his chief of the Department of High-Speed Aircraft, Alexander Arhangelsky, worked themselves ragged. They had a Herculean task in front of them. To design the aircraft of the new era was only a part of the job. 
they also had to plan new production facilities, introduce new technologies to the workforce, and ultimately provide uninterrupted production and shipment. On September 14, 1936, something terrible happened to a column of the Spanish Nationalist forces. Nimble shadows crossed the sky, raining fire on everything on the ground. What's worse, it turned out that this new menace was nine previous from the Nationalist fighters and Nationalist AA guns. It could evade both by sheer speed. If Nationalist pilots persevered, they got outpaced, outmaneuvered, and then shot down. It was a complete shock. In the fall of 1937, the SB made it to Asia and left quite an impression on the Japanese pilots. The Soviet high-speed bombers bearing Chinese markings turned out to be a very tough nut to crack for unarmored Japanese fighters. As the years went by, the TUSB started to lose its biggest advantage. The aircraft makers of the world produced more and more high-speed planes, and by the start of the World War II, the Soviet design was already outdated. But the deed was done. Tupolev managed to capture the imagination of his peers. The designers, who made the excellent German Junkers 88, the Japanese Ki-21 and the American DB-7, were all, to an extent, following in Tupolev's footsteps. In one of our previous episodes, we discussed some user-made missions that you could find at the treasure house that is live.worthunder.com. Spoiler alert! That's not the only thing you can find there. It's not worth fighting if your vehicle is not pretty enough, and that's a fact. We all have different definitions of pretty, of course, but honestly, we're all constantly amazed by the things you guys do with our models. Just check this out. The stunning work was created by the player called Bradyaga Yenot. That's the way the wooden Lavichkin Gorbunov Gutkov, or otherwise known as Lag 3, looked before it was painted. What a beauty, huh? Then there's this quality historical rework of the F6F5N by Vaches, cockpit included. Great work, mate. Lots of little details, scratches. It's so really nice to look at. Don't even want to leave this aircraft, ever. The next one is an oldie, but a goodie. An experimental dazzle paint scheme for the Mustang Mark I, designed in 1942, and brought to the game by a player called Spoguter. We guess that's the way it is pronounced. What's interesting is that this camouflage doesn't really conceal the aircraft. The idea is to confuse enemy pilots, making it hard for them to estimate the exact position of the plane. Though rather effective, it was never actually adopted. It was a real chore to paint all this, apparently. And finally, there is this. Yep, an extremely modern adaptive stealth camouflage for the German HO-229, coming straight out of a good science fiction movie. Because why the hell not? Great work by a player with a rather robotic name of X182008. And in case you weren't aware, you can download all these camos and use them in game. Isn't that fantastic? Keep up the good work, folks. Finally, it's time for the traditional last part of our show Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more lighthearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first question comes from a player called Rational Reality American. What actually happens when you report another player in game? Justice. Seriously though, we have a dedicated team of people that work with player-generated reports and they do all they can to make sure that wrongdoers are dealt with accordingly. Demonfly6 has a question about bouncing bombs. Did you guys add the mechanic that allows you to skip bombs on water at high speeds? Yeah, we totally did. Skip bombing is a lot of fun. We even had a skip bombing challenge a few episodes ago. Check it out. Then there's a question from a player called Panzer Pupper. Why is the Japanese tank tree full of other nations' tanks? Well, historically, the Japanese didn't rely that much on heavy armor, and Japan has always lagged behind the rest of the world where the tank design is concerned. 
they just had other priorities. In the end, there are a lot of interesting Japanese machines in the tree, but we had to throw some other vehicles in there, of course, only those that made sense, to make it viable. Do you like the results? The last message comes from a player called Skendren and Banefire. This game is at times glorious and infuriating. One game I can score at the top of the team, earn a chest full of medals and achieve all the kills and caps. The next game I run through all my spawn points in the first couple of minutes because I didn't spot the flanker sniping from a bush. I slog through the aggravation just for those glorious moments. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, mate. Good luck and may you be victorious. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.